Thank you. Welcome. Um, it will take a few minutes for participants to come into the room, but um, welcome everybody to this, the third of the four um, summer webinar series, Amicus on Death Row. And today we will be looking at Doctors on Death Row. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Professor John York, who will introduce our esteemed speakers today, whom we are extremely thrilled to have with, with us today. So over to you, John, thank you. Thank you, Margot. It, this is, uh, the, as Margot said, the third in our series. We've had such wonderful sessions so far. We began with the arts, looking at, at uh, the theme of Shakespeare and how Shakespeare discusses the death penalty in his plays. And then we went on to discuss Francesco Goya's art and the aesthetics of the execution scene. And then uh, last Thursday, we, we looked at the theological aspects of the death penalty and the extent to which the Catholic Church opposes the death penalty, vis-a-vis -vis also the Anglican Church. So you have the theological aspects Today, I am delighted to say that we're, we're now going into the medical field and, and looking at medical ethics and also the science of the death penalty. Um, we have two absolute legends, if, if I may say, in our field. And it's it's an absolute honor and a privilege uh, that, that we have. I'm gonna do a very brief uh, intro and you'll see why it's gonna be more expansive later on. But Professor uh, Deborah Denno, who's Professor of uh, Law at Fordham University. She is the Arthur A. McGivney Professor of Law and founding director of Neuroscience and Law Center at Fordham Law School. But, but that actually just doesn't do justice. Being from England, we can say this. She's the queen of understanding how the lethal injection process is perhaps a violation of the Eighth Amendment of the United States. And we're, we're wonderfully honored to have Deborah with us today. And, and I think that if I'm, uh, I, I can't see the list of participants, but I think that Robin Conrad is joining us this evening, who's an assistant federal public defender from Alabama. And I just want to say thank you to Robin because she advised me about how wonderful Joel is and how he's uh, the best uh, an, an anesthesiologist in the field of expert testimony in capital trials and also in appeals. And it's a great honor that we have uh, Dr. Joel Zivot with us today from Emory University School of Medicine. So it's gonna be a wonderful evening discussing these medical issues. And, uh, and also I just want to say that if you're uh, with us and you're on Twitter, please use hashtag all one word, amicus on death row. And if you post those questions uh, for us, I'll, I'll keep my eye on Twitter as well. And then as they come up, we'll put those questions to Debbie and uh, Joel th throughout, throughout the session. Okay, so let's begin. So I've just got a basic question to start us off with. How did you both first become interested in the death penalty? And then how has that guided your careers? Okay, should I, should I answer that first? So, okay, I'll just, I'll just plunge in. So, uh, I first got interested in the death penalty in the early 80s, if you can believe it. I was a criminology student at the University of Pennsylvania. My mentor, Marvin Wolfgang, was doing a large study on race uh, throughout the country. And then at the same time, a few years later, New, uh, the New Jersey Public Defender's Office wanted statisticians to analyze their data. And a colleague and I did that for eight years. But I have to say, until the New Jersey study, I thought the death penalty, I wasn't so interested in it. I thought it was depressing for obvious reasons. And, uh, and I, I didn't see the legal issues as, a, as intricate and as evolving in the, certainly in the way that I do now. And then by 1991, and when I got to Fordham, I hit the ground running looking at execution methods, just thinking, you know, I'd probably just do an, a, one article on electrocution and that would be it, but you know, uh, the rest is history. I haven't stopped uh, examining that. And certainly uh, physicians, the kind of experts like Joel, uh, have, have given me more to write about because they've just uncovered so much more. So, so on to Joel on, with that note. Well, um, uh, for me, I'm an, I'm an anesthesiologist and uh, I'm from Canada originally. And in Canada, we don't have the death penalty. Uh, I've been in the U.S. for a number of years, and uh, what I noticed was there was a drug that was commonly used at the uh, during an induction of an anesthetic, the beginning of an anesthetic, called sodium thiopental. 
And maybe uh, like a decade or so ago now, sodium thiopental just disappeared. And I thought, well, that's odd. Where did it go? Did we forget how to use it? Um, you know, what was the nature of uh, where it, it went? And so I began to investigate. And I discovered this, uh, what was at the time to me, a surprising connection between sodium thiopental and the death penalty. Uh, it turned out that, and the story that's told may be apocryphal, but the version of it is, goes something like this, that the uh, last company that was manufacturing sodium thiopental at the time was a company called Hospira, and they were making sodium thiopental in Italy. Uh, it, um, Hospira was an American company, but they were manufacturing in Italy. And of course, Italy being part of the EU, there is a, um, a rule that states that uh, nothing that is made in the EU can be used for the death penalty. And Hospira was approached and they said, uh, and they were asked, we think that your sodium thiopental may be ending up in the death penalty. Can you promise that it won't be used in that way? And they said, well, we, we can't promise that. And so we're just gonna stop making it. And so poof, it was gone. Um, and when I, when I encountered this, uh, I, I was shocked because I thought, well, wait a minute, sodium thiopental is really a drug and what's it doing uh, to kill people? Um, and so that um, I, I started to investigate. Uh, that's the beauty of the internet. You can just start looking things up and tracking people down. And one of the first people that I tracked down actually was Debbie. I've, uh, she wrote an article about something and I thought, oh, wow, I, I want to meet this person. So I just emailed her and, you know, stupidly she replied. So it's her <laughs> fault. And, and uh, we've, you know, developed a very strong, you know, connection over this over the years. Um, I also um, wrote something or I approached the, an organization in the U.S. Here called the Death Penalty Information Center that I'm sure is you know, known to many. Uh, and I just uh, also just emailed them and said, I think I'd like to write something about this because I'm upset. And so uh, I wrote an opinion piece. Uh, they helped me uh, edit an opinion piece that was put in USA Today. And I'd never really done that before. I just wrote it and said how I was, um, you know, outraged that the death penalty was encroaching on the practice of medicine. And, and uh, after that, my phone started ringing. And I got, uh, you know, calls from attorneys saying, hey, we read your piece and would you like to help us um, as an expert witness, and I guess the rest is is history. That's thank you so much, both. And uh, yes, and, and, and what a, an enriching history that you've both brought to this subject, and uh, to help us all to understand this better. Can can we go back almost two and a half thousand years to to Socrates? And it's very uh, famous that Socrates uh, uh, had the death penalty by drinking hemlock. But I just just like to read a little s extract, and then to ask you both the extent to which we may have might be revisiting some of these issues or the extent to which perhaps we have learned from these issues. So Plato uh, records the last day of Socrates and in the Phaedo, the executioner says to Socrates, we only prepare what we regard as the normal dose Socrates. So that's the executioner saying to Socrates about the specifics of the, of the pharmacology of, of what Socrates is about to drink. Then later on, um, an observer says to a traveler who's visiting um, these, uh, the region in Athens, it's, the observer says, it is a long time since we had a visitor who could come give us any definite information except that he was executed by drinking hemlock. No one would tell us any more than that. What I find quite interesting about this passage, of course, Plato uh, uh, wrote this and in his laws, he has the, uh, many, uh, the, the capital uh, offenses is quite large uh, within the laws. And then when he writes his Republic, his utopian text, he's restricting the death penalty. And there's something that's happening here, which I think uh, he's kind of uh, asking us to, to think about and, and, and uh, re reflect upon. And that's the, first of all, the preparation of the drug, then the pharmacology and the go uh, and, 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 and the dose, the accuracy, transparency of information, and then the extent of the scientific knowledge at that time with regards to the appropriateness of this execution. What are your reflections upon what happened there? And then how, how do you think this applies to us today? Oh, you wanna go first? Uh, so 
you know, hemlock is interesting. I've never um, used hemlock. Uh, uh, I know it takes, I think something like maybe six to eight leaves of, of the plant will, will do it. And um, the, the chemical structure um, of, of, of the poison was not really fully characterized, I think, until like uh, the late 1800s. So I think that what was done at the time, of course, was, uh, I suppose, you know, a serendipitous observation, which is, of course, the way a lot of scientific inquiry begins. Um, the, the problem here, of course, and which I think will be a theme in our conversation today, is this idea about using science as a, a cover, I think, um, an un unwitting cover of, of civility over the act of punishment and killing. So if you were saying that, you know, what is the proper hemlock dose to kill, you're, you know, I can put my mind to it, I guess, you know, as a physician or, uh, you know, with respect to say the chemistry of it, but of course, I need to step back and say, well, wait a minute, you know, we're talking about killing someone and it's, that's, there's no, that's not a therapeutic use. Uh, you know, hemlock kills a little bit like curare and, and uh, curare is a, you know, is a drug that paralyzes and there are paralytics that are used in the death penalty currently in certain places. And the paralytics also have a therapeutic um, role. So, I've never seen anyone employ uh, a therapeutic role for hemlock, but possibly. So in that way, maybe it, it could be, you know, legitimately used in science, but it's the, I think it's the, the illegitimate use again, but under kind of the cover of science, which is created to create this, I think, uh, impression of civility here in something that I would, you know, argue is certainly uncivilized. I mean, what was uh, Socrates' crime? I, I think it was. Uh, um, I disrupting can't even... the disrupting the morals of the, of the young in Athens. Yeah, it, it was something. I think today, you know, that it wouldn't even get you cancelled on on Twitter. I don't think so. It seems a bit harsh. So the fact that science should step in and say, "Here, we let me help you." Well, that's not something I think we can be proud of. Yeah, though, I, uh, I'll just add on to that. I mean, first of all, it's a great quote. It sort of summarizes all these decades, particularly with lethal injection, um, this idea that at some point we're going to have the right dose, right? We're going to have the right chemical and the right drugs, and we'll know what we're going to do. And we never have. It's just gotten worse. And that was definitely the attitude in 1977 when lethal injection was first created when you look at the, the debates in the Oklahoma legislature, uh, the feeling was at the time that o Oklahoma adopted lethal injection was that you know with time, we're gonna have better drugs. They adopted lethal injection with the idea that by the time it's actually gonna be used on somebody, we'll, we'll have better drugs, we'll know much more, we'll have a better solution. And of course we never did. I mean, what we ended up doing was adopting Jay Chapman's uh, a hastily created three drug formula then uh, that that uh, that we keep from 1977 what to you know 2010 until as Joel was saying sodium thiopental starts you know running out or we're no longer using it in this country but then we get totally chaotic and get thrown off and try to get other other kinds of doses other kinds of drugs better drugs anything is what, really what we're grabbing at because the death penalty in the United States is always about continuing to kill people at, at no matter the cost. And uh, so that's really the driving force here as opposed to the UK, which I think your last execution was in what, 1965 or something, something like that. So, so we've never gotten the right dose, the, this perfect uh, dose. I think that's what everyone's fear was at the beginning with all this criticism of the lethal injection uh, that, you know, the more you criticize it, the better they're going to get, the better the executioners are going to get. They're just going to devise a better formula. And of course, they never have. They've only, only gotten worse with time. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so I think that quote sort of substantiates what we've been seeing over these decades. 
Thank you very much. Okay, so let's go into now the US constitutional process and, and have a look at the science here. So in the Supreme Court case of Bayes versus Reese, it established the standard under the Eighth Amendment that for an execution to be constitutional, it cannot constitute what it termed needless suffering. If I could just ask you both from your personal experiences, and Joel, obviously, as a as um, with your medical background, but uh, you've given a lot of testimony in court and contributed to, to many um, court trials. So you might have some thoughts about how the legal process perhaps either helped you or stifled you. But perhaps I could just ask you both, what do you think science as an institution and law as an institution, how do you think it contributes to perhaps achieving this understanding of what is needless suffering? Or do you think when science and law interacts, we still don't really have a clear understanding of what that means. Again, Joel, please. Well, so the kind of work that I'm commonly uh, involved in is, is uh, a kind of a, um, it, it's called an as applied challenge, for example. So an as applied challenge is when an inmate uh, will claim, or will argue that the method of execution as applied to them will cause cruelty. And, and it's, you know, the Eighth Amendment is, is what is commonly cited here. And it's, it's really this kind of uh, idea of, of, of cruelty. So cruelty, um, as I've written, is not, uh, the absence of cruelty is not the presence of humaneness. And even the idea of suffering, you know, may be problematic here. Um, I will tell you that, interestingly, the court has decided that there's such a thing as they call the normal pain of dying. I, I don't know what the normal pain of dying is. Uh, I've been around a lot of dying, uh, and I'm not sure if I could characterize what that is. Sometimes the deaths that I've observed have seemed painful, and other times, not really. Uh, it's hard to know. Um, so I, I think that the, what the law requires, uh, I guess, to be, uh, to comport, you know, with the Eighth Amendment is this idea that the, the, the method of punishment can't be cruel. And of course, what we define as cruel will naturally evolve commensurate, you know, with the evolution of civil society. I think that whereas medicine, you know, has something to say about pain control, it doesn't have a lot to say about cruelty. Not, not in a, you know, not in, in a in a way that maybe the law would would hope, uh, and I think that the law ha has a simple idea in a way about what the medicine can do, and and the problem of lethal injection. The reason why I think it's hung on so long is because outwardly it's just so bloodless. Generally, you know, even though there are quote botched executions, at least to watch one. I've witnessed an execution, not much actually happens. Even with my trained eye, I couldn't see much, uh, which was distressing because of course, uh, that's really what we're trying to determine. And so what the, you know, what the technique usually does is to just to give a really, really large quantity and figuring that more would be better and that would be sufficient. And as long as outwardly it looks okay, you know, then nothing is amiss. Of course, that turns out to be flawed reasoning. But in, in, in my experience, the court is sort of stubbornly hanging on to this. And, and I think that because maybe they think any other kind of method of execution will be just so obviously not bloodless, like when you look at it, that that will, you know, will stir the debate. I mean, I, I think that's the debate we need to have. But lethal injection hangs on, I think, because it just doesn't look like much is, is really happening. But that, of course, is not the case. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really great uh, foundation, um, you know, to start out a, any kind of discussion on the, you know, interaction between, between law and science. I mean, in, in addition to what Joel was saying, I mean, you know, law also is focused on perpetuating this this punishment, as I was, as I was saying before, but we also have public opinion that that wants it. So, I think you know, with, I mean, certainly politics come in to medicine as well, uh, but we have added factors that make it 
even harder to decipher lethal injection. We have an enormous amount of secrecy, not only the secrecy of not being able to detect what, whether somebody is actually suffering. Uh, if you know someone like Joel can't detect it, then who, who could uh, just, just on a gurney or something like that. But we also have an enormous amount of secrecy where we can't even begin to unravel whether pain is going on uh, irrespective of whether somebody is, is, is demonstrating it. So uh, oftentimes we don't know exactly what drugs are being used. They don't always correspond with what the legislature states or even what's on the protocol. We've seen that time and again. We don't know the exact amounts of the drugs. Uh, we don't know what the executioners are doing or what their qualifications are. Uh, and and uh, much of the pain or distress uh, and, and these botches are, are due to the sheer incompetence that executioners um, are, are exhibiting. In, a, in addition to the fact that the court, um, you, know, you know, we've had these three Supreme Court cases has just uh, from 2008 to, uh, to 2019 has made the standard even more, uh, more difficult and more challenging uh, to prove. Uh, ironically, courts never uh, got involved in any lethal injection execution uh, litigation, much less, uh, or not the Supreme Court, I should say, or any execution method until 2008. That's extraordinary. We've had um, the death penalty since the, the 1608, since the start of this country's history. And it takes until then uh, for the Supreme Court to actually evaluate any method of execution. So on the one hand, Joel, you're absolutely right that lethal injection has been perpetuated. On the other hand, uh, it has also been the most heavily litigated execution method and the, the only method in which the Supreme Court has gotten involved and, and that being uh, three times. So I think, you know, that, that I, I just wanna point that out. And it's also succeeded in delaying uh, executions are actually halting them in some states in this in this country. So there's there's sort of a mix going on here. That's a great point, uh, Deborah, about the the assessment by the Supreme Court. I, I was wondering, both of you, do you think that has to do with some well, something to do with the change in the pharmacology used in executions? So it's had to assess these the, the new method because I, I guess you know Enri is it Enri Kemler the uh, is that the electric chair case? Yeah, that's the electrocution, the 1890 yeah. electrocution case, yes. Exactly, and so electric, electricity is electricity, but with pharmacology, we're dealing with different things. Is there anything in, in that, um, Joel, to Deborah, the change in the composition? Well, I think, you know, Deborah makes the point that when lethal injection began, uh, it was begun, like it was made it as a kind of a casual suggestion is the story that's told. And because let's be clear that there's no configuration of lethal injection that becomes either a medical act or a scientific act, okay? These are punishments uh, that are you know, designed by the state. The state is responsible. Now doctors have hung around, okay? And, and that's a problem. Uh, I think that um, you know, lethal injection it, the problem of lethal injection is that it, it impersonates a medical act so convincingly that sometimes even doctors are fooled uh, and they believe that they have some sort of a, a mandate. But as a doctor, of course, you know, I can only uh, treat or interact with people in a doctor patient relationship if that person is my patient. And to suggest that if I put in a lab coat and stand next to someone who's being executed, if they're now a patient, that just isn't the case. So I think I have no mandate. And the way that the states that execute um, modify their protocol is basically whatever they can get their hands on. It just comes down to that. So if something is not available, they cast about for something else and, and they look for it and they get it. And, and to Debbie's point, you know, secrecy, which the state in certain jurisdictions impose, you know, shrouds the truth. So even if you wanted to try to understand and to try to create some, you know, even an uncomfortable evaluation of method, it's extremely difficult to do so. So I feel like I'm always just trying to, you know, picking up the roadkill and trying to make sense of what exactly is happening here. And the state, you know, is not helpful 
in, in trying to do this. Uh, you know, it's, I think it seems pretty obvious that if you've got something, if you don't have anything to hide, then you don't need uh, to have secrets. But to suggest that there are secrets means I think you've got something to hide because there is something that needs to be hidden here. Uh, and so on the one hand, I, I, you know, I want to try to make sense of this. On the other hand, I, 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 want, to, I want to have nothing to do with this. Yeah. And if I could just um, uh, flesh out a little bit these, these three Supreme Court cases in Bayes v. Rees in 2008, uh, the, the uh, three drug protocol at issue there was the standard traditional 1977 protocol that Jay Chapman came up with. Uh, and the reason, the only reason it was being litigated then was um, there were starting to be so many challenges, thanks to, you know, folks like Joel who were, who were getting involved and testifying and explaining to courts uh, and being very useful, particularly in state courts, on, on the devastation or the potential devastation that lethal injection was causing. So that was the standard protocol. Ironically, it was after Bayes validated, so to speak, um, the court, that standard protocol, that the first drug that Joel mentioned, the sodium thiopental, started to run out in this country. It's a very old drug. Uh, and you know, Joel would know better than I, but I don't think surgeons use it very much and et cetera. It's mostly um, made in, in, um, in, in other, other countries. So, uh, so it was just the two additional cases that had the, the newer sort of pharma, pharmacology of the newer, uh, the newer drugs. But it's, uh, the court took it uh, because there was a one year moratorium on executions. There were the, the, the litigation the lethal injection challenges were so successful, it was halting the death penalty. And it really forced the court into a, into a corner uh, in, a, in a way, at least with execution methods, it had a corner it had never seen before. Yes, and just to pick up on, on that, you, you both mentioned sodium thiopental and, and Joel earlier mentioned the, 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 uh, the case of Italy and the way the EU has helped. Well, what's very interesting, there was a case in the English High Court called Argoski and Bayes, and it is the Bayes of the Bayes and, and, and Reese case. And that challenge, the EU directed, well, that challenge uh, arose because there was a, a kind of, um, well, there's, there was a pharmacist who was basically making sodium thiopental in a garage, and, uh, and somehow um, uh, uh, it was uh, Tennessee bought it from this, this garage to supply it within the state prisons for executions. This case was challenged in the English High Court and, and, and basically the courts stated that it read the EU directive in a very literal sense. They had stated that execution technologies, which included lethal injection, it is in, we, under EU law, we cannot trade in this. We cannot make the execution technology in Europe. We cannot export it to anywhere in the world. The English High Court basically said, it doesn't mention the substance in the regulation. So it allowed for the trade, but our business secretary then made a, an intervention and then stopped the trade. I don't know if Margot or Anna has time, you can find the case Bayes versus Rees versus Sargoski and put, and put it up on, on, on the chat for the, uh, for the audience. At, at this time, can I just remind the audience that please feel free to post questions and we'll put those to uh, Deborah and Joel before we move on. I do see that Anna actually uh, posed a question. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask this. Um, so um, Deborah and Joel, can punishment ever rightly be, be within the realm of medicine rather than law? And does the notion of punishment not contradict the objective amoral nature of medicine? What, sh shall I, let me- uh, Go ahead, Joel, let me, yes. Let me see. So, so, you know, there are classically four um, principles of secular ethics uh, that are offered uh, for practitioners, for, you know, medical practitioners of, that were proposed by Beecham and Childress a number of years ago. The first principle is, um, first of all, do no harm. And that's kind of an astounding way to begin, if you think about it. You know, of all the kinds of professions that you might do, it, you know, it's like, I think the SAS in Britain is he who dares wins or something. You know, that's not what we get. We start with, first of all, do no harm. So, 
you're already setting yourself up for something that's going to be quite, um, uh, you know, th that I think rightly understands that it is very easy for medicine to be an arm of state power in a way that it should not. Um, the second, of course, principle is to do good. Uh, but we start with, first of all, do no harm. And even just if you toggle between those two, I think that you're really um, getting kind of to you know, the heart of the problem. Medicine, you know, can be used to mollify. You know, it can be used to um, to create stupor, uh, and outwardly, that may appear that's quite an astounding thing to be able to do to somebody. You know, I've I've had you know patients where I've I've literally stuck you know medicine in a syringe through their shirt, you know, into their shoulder to get them to mollify them for their own good. And because they had something critical and I couldn't get control of them any other way. So that's a powerful and heavy thing to be able to do to somebody. Uh, and there are risks, of course, of that. So, you know, the, I, I think that, the, what is it, you know, the road to, uh, to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that even though, you know, doctors may think that they've got something to do here, that they can use the power of medicine in a way that can aid the state you know, I would offer great caution. Uh, you know, John, you and I had a conversation where I said to you, look, you know, physicians like to be next to power. They're, that's a thing, you know, the, the way that medicine, like, why is it that doctors are hanging around here? You know, it's honestly, you know, this, the kind of the hierarchical nature of prisons, of authority, uh, and the way this works actually feels not unlike the way medicine conducts itself. So it, 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 will, it will aid and abet. And, and, and the history of medicine you know, is not always a, a positive one. Doctors have been involved in terrible uh, um, uses of the technology uh, of, of medicine. And I, I think this is another example of it. Like I, you know, people will ask me, well, if you can't kill them this way, how can we kill them? And, and I, you know, I don't fall for it. I say, look, I'm, I'm not an expert in killing. I'd like to think I'm an expert in unkilling. Uh, and if you want, you know, an expert in killing, I guess you need a ninja or James Bond or something. But I, but I, there, you know, like medicine is struggles. Uh, and, and I've talked with people who very seriously say, look, I think I see suffering here and therefore I have a mandate. But I, you know, I, we didn't make that suffering. That's not my responsibility, you know, to, to solve suffering in that way. So I love the question. I love yeah, Joel's response. I have very little to add. Okay, no, that's uh, great. Well, let, well, no, in fact, well, let's move into the ethics then, and let's go through each section of the capital judicial process. And then, so uh, I think uh, Joel has um, introduced a uh, uh, principles of medical ethics there and looking at Hippocrates' statements, primum non non sia, yes, first do no harm. So with that in mind, can we speak to the specific sections then of the of the death penalty? So what how does first do no harm implicate the question of healthcare professionals being expert witnesses advising the state and the defense and then during the capital trial? What kind of ethical principles should you think inform their contributions in those parts? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. No, no pun intended there. Um, it, uh, um, you know, just simply because I think um, the experts testifying have really changed, been a game changer in lethal injection executions and, and lethal injection litigation starting in 1977. And I feel freer that I can talk about this because I've been following it for a long time. Uh, you know, not only did I rely very heavily on experts when I first started writing about lethal injection because everybody said lethal injection is so much better than electrocution, but I never thought so. And, and the reason I never thought so is because of Edward Bruner, who at that time was the um, chief anesthesiologist at Northwestern Medical School. And he was testifying very early on and a couple of other people. And they were educating us. They were certainly educating me. I, I, all I had at that time were his, his, uh, you know, his transcripts and his, uh, his depositions and things like that. Uh, so without him, 
providing a knowledge base. Uh, and uh, I would have concluded as everybody else was doing that lethal injection was so much better. Whereas he was really enlightening uh, the people writing about this topic, but also he was testifying early on. He was one of the first people to testify in these cases. He's the first person to testify in every any evidentiary hearing on lethal injection, and that was in Texas. And so, uh, and I know because I, I was there at that time with him. Uh, and without him, uh, and those, that kind of factual foundation, uh, people really would have been lost. And uh, he, we wouldn't have known that the kind of protocol that they were presenting to us in court was, was horrifying. And, and lawyers wouldn't have had that level uh, of sophistication. So, you know, I think for the experts who have followed, and of course, including uh, uh, Joel, that, um, that this has really changed the nature of lethal injection litigation. It's what has halted litigation in some states. And, uh, and has made it as sophisticated uh, as, as it has become relative to, to what we were talking about several decades ago. You know, can I, so I, I've been involved in a number of these cases and I'll tell you that every single case I believe that I've been involved with that the inmate eventually has been executed. So my track record is 100% failure. And, and after I do this, I call Debbie and, and say, Debbie, I think I'm doing nothing here. You know, I, 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 and, and then Debbie cheers me up like she just cheered me up again right now. But uh, it feels like I'm, you know, we're spinning our wheels. And I just wanna, and I, I, I think I've got this case right. Is it, is it right to say that after Estelle and Gamble, that that was the case that established that inmates had a constitutional right to health care? because that's, they're actually the only citizens of the United States that have a constitutional right to healthcare. And the healthcare has to be real. So when you ask me, you know, what is the job of the doctor? Well, here's a, here's a conundrum for you. You know, when Clayton Lockett was uh, executed, so not surprisingly, he didn't want to come out of his cell on the day of his execution. So they tased him and dragged him out of his cell. And in the melee, he sustained an injury onto his arm, a laceration on his arm. And the laceration was evaluated you know, by the medical team and they said, ah, oh, he doesn't need stitches. And, and so you can think, wait a minute, you're just about to execute him and you're determining whether you should stitch the wound that you just created. But I actually think that what that tells you is that inmates are, need healthcare. And so when does that right to healthcare get extinguished? You know, can you both kill someone and maintain their health while you're doing it? I mean, it's impossible. But there isn't something that I've suggested uh, that if the execution should be, quote, botched, and, and that's a complicated kind of word, but if it seems, if there's a determination the execution is going to fail, like, frankly, Clayton Lockett's execution was a failure. Uh, and that what he was entitled to was his right to health care, which should have involved real resuscitation. So if you want to know what the doctor's job is, so you're standing there with a proverbial crash cart ready to go and to revive someone should the execution fail, like that's a doctor's job. That's an area that I'm quite comfortable with. But in terms of helping someone die in some way, like, um, you know, there's a physician in Georgia who claims that, um, you know, that uh, he thinks of death, the death penalty is like a, as a terminal illness. And he's there just trying to help the terminal illness and, 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 and make it uh, more, uh, less painful. And I say, well, wait a minute, you know, the job of the doctor is to fight illness and that's an easy one to fight. So I'm not quite following your logic there, you know, but that's what some doctors claim. You know, there is a role for medicine clearly, which is to oppose this. You know, there's no pharmaceutical has ever been made where the package insert says, this is the dose for execution. You know, these are things that are, are taken, usurped, you know, um, and, and I, I know I, I object. I object to the use of any of this, and I will not, you know, be a party to any kind of fiction that claims that medicine can improve this. It's not, not the job of medicine, not a doctor's job. And if so I could just flesh out, or go ahead, John. Uh, no, 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 I just wanted to flesh out um, uh, to Joel's comments about the Clayton Lockett case. It was... You know, it was certainly, you know, it's a medical failure, but it was also a political 
failure. And I remember talking about this uh, with you, Joel, right afterwards, because, um, you know, not only had it uh, followed the botches of Michael uh, Lee Wilson and, and Dennis McGuire, I mean, here, the 2014 was a key case of uh, a, a huge array of uh, botches and, and Joseph Woods botch right after uh, Clayton Lockett's number one, but number two, uh, you know, Clayton Lockett's botch brought the White House out for the first, I think for the first time in this country's history. Uh, I mean, then President Obama said that, you know, it, it uh, you know, his press secretary said it felt short of, um, you know, humane standards. I'm, I'm quoting that. And, and President, then President Obama himself said it was, you know, quote, deeply disturbing. I know, I don't recall any U.S. president ever coming forward. And, um, and he ordered then attorney, uh, you know, General uh, Holder to, to review the, you know, the state's policies on lethal injection executions. Uh, and, you know, all of us in this community, probably the European community too, thought that this would be a game changer, right? I mean, here, here you know, we have this um, AG who's supposed to review all the execution methods challenges. And also then President Obama mentioned the, you know, the racial inequities uh, in, the, in the death penalty. So that was a moment where everything could have changed uh, with the death penalty in this country and nothing happened, uh, which was so frustrating. And I do contrast the UK on that, where your government um, has, has moved forward on this, right? Over the last decades in a way that, that the United States never has. So uh, I do, do think that's a really valuable contrast. Uh, uh, but this was our time to do something and, and nothing happened with the, you know, in addition with a very popular and persuasive president. I'm done. <laughs> no, 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 that, that, that was wonderful. I, I was just soaking in what you were saying. That, yeah, I think, yes, but uh, our government has its major faults, but we won't go into that this evening. <laughs> We've noticed a few recently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a few, tra yeah, anyway, no, 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 I absolutely won't. Right, um, can we go to death row then? So someone's on death row. Um, where does medical ethics come into the, uh, the healthcare treatment of someone that on death row? And then perhaps this touches on something that Joel has spoken about earlier. Then a healthcare professional's, um, uh, kind of contributions, which actually might help the state execute them. So how, what are your thoughts on that part of the process? Oh my God, where to begin? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think that, um, you know, there is a, so I'm in, in an as applied challenge, I'm, I'm asked to come and evaluate an inmate because to your point, uh, you know, uh, inmates have a right to health care and you can't kill them with illness. So a person like I've written that you can be too sick to be executed and and, and uh, others as well. And that's an odd idea to people, but that's what that's what the law requires. And there was a, a case that I was involved with, um, Ernest Johnson, that I know that uh, Debbie knows about. And Ernest Johnson had a um, had a brain tumor. And uh, his brain tumor was resected, and it was sort of a sub, what's called a subtotal resection. There was still a little bit of tumor remained, and he had a, a pretty significant neurological disability as a consequence of it. He was pretty um, frail as a consequence of it. And, and so I was asked to see him with this kind of as applied challenge and what would happen in him. And I remember I saw, I, when I, and I've been, I said, I've been to death row in a lot of places, I've met a lot of these, these inmates. And so I go and see Ernest Johnson and, uh, you know, we're talking and uh, in his history, you know, he makes a comment about having smoked or something. And so, you know, um, I can't help myself. I say, you know, smoking is bad for you and you should not do it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, you know what? You can smoke if you want to. Like, I, you know, it's just it's it, it, I think just smoking was not allowed in the prison that, anyway, but it just. You know, when you're a doctor trying to kind of just be one, it's very strange to talk to people about their medical condition without trying to kind of correct their medical condition. And the, the complexity is, so the classic case of this was Rusty Bucklew, 
who I was also saw many times and, and Rusty Bucklew, Bucklew versus Pressite, uh, you know, was decided, I think, quite atrociously um, at the Supreme Court. And I think that, um, um, that uh, the justice, um, gosh, I'm just blanking his name because I guess I don't like him. Uh, he, he, uh, um, who was the majority opinion in? in uh, I think it, it was Alito, wasn't it? I'm, no, it wasn't. Uh, um, it wasn't. Okay. Anyway, they, they got it wrong. They just got they got it wrong. But um, when um, I went to see Bucklew, so Bucklew had tumors in his mouth, and and he couldn't lie flat. Uh, and because he couldn't lie flat, there was a question about it was Neil Gorsuch. Sorry, Gorsuch. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Um, Buckley couldn't, right. lie, couldn't lie flat and, and uh, he's, these tumors were kind of uh, blood filled and uh, you know, we kind of told this story about how there was no easy way to execute him and the tumors were growing. And uh, so Bucklew needed to have some procedure and he, in order to do it, he had a tracheostomy. And so now you're the doctor taking care of Bucklew, you know Bucklew is facing execution. And if you put a tracheostomy in Bucklew, two things will happen. I guess you can maybe do your surgical procedure, but now the state can execute him because now you've given them a patent airway, okay? And, and now this question about, about choking is gone. So if you're the doctor and are you sort of saying, well, I, you know, I don't know anything about that or I choose not to know anything about that. Or I choose not to recognize that in fact, what I think is therapeutic is in fact making the state able to kill Bucklew and that's exactly what happened. That after Bucklew had his trach, the state was able to figure out now how to kill him without it causing him choking when he died. So that's the contribution of medicine. And, and there is the problem. You know, you have to know, you have to understand that, you know, what you're doing has an implication outside of your examination room and outside of your hospital. You have to know who these people are and what you're trying to do. I understand that the doctor was just trying to, I guess, solve a problem, an immediate one. But by solving an immediate problem, you know, he killed his patient in, in a sense, or he was involved in the killing of his patient. Deborah, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I it's it's um, hard to add add to that. Yeah. I think we can move on to in, something in English, else. In English medical law, when when a doctor um, treats a symptom, but then that symptom has a cascade for a a worse effect later on. In English medical law, it's called the doctrine of double effect. And, um, and, and it's a great term. Yeah, and, and it kind of uh, re reminded me of a case which I'm sure that Deborah knows, and, and you, you, you probably do as well, Jules, Singleton versus Norris. So we have the medicate to execute kind of case. And that kind of speaks to that scenario that, that, that you were painting, uh, uh, yeah, that you were describing there, Joel. I was wondering, um, in the minds of medical practitioners, are they, in these circumstances, are they purely focused on treating that medical problem? And then do they disassociate themselves from the fact that that treatment can then give the state an opportunity to impose executions? Or, or, I, or yeah, I, I guess what I'm asking is, what extent does this come into play? What? Well, I mean, the doctor of the double effect that you mentioned, of course, this is Aquinas, and, and Aquinas, yeah, uh, well. you know, talks about um, this idea about doing two things where one thing can cause harm and the other thing can cause good. And the, you know, the idea here is that the good thing, you know, outweighs the harm of the, uh, you know, the harm effect. And I think that that's a, you know, a, a useful but simple way of looking at certain sorts of kinds of problems. Like, I mean, my knock on, yeah. uh, you know, no disrespect to Aquinas, but I think that that's a simple, a simple way of looking at a kind of, kind of a more complicated problem. So I, I think that, you know, when I thought you say with well, the doctors just saying, look, I'm here just to, you know, to practice medicine. Look, uh, you know, everybody is, you know, exists within the world, you know, it's the same thing to say, you know, and I, I hesitate, to, hesitate to use this corollary, but, you know, I was only following orders. So mm -hmm. I, I think that to claim that you are, you don't know, you know, what else is gone on here, uh, what else is at stake here, I think feels false. And uh, as a physician, you know, I need to know the whole story, you know, as it affects the patient before me. 
you know, that uh, there are, and certainly it would be hard to imagine that you could, it, I mean, there is this, you know, concern about how to, how to treat inmates in hospitals. There's a lot of kind of conversation about how to do that. So maybe you're trying to say, well, look, I'm just absolutely blind, you know, to the crime, which I think is fair. You, you should be, you know, like, as a doctor, it's not my job to kind of judge the actions of others in that way. I treat everyone, you know, the same. They, they seek my help. I provide it. But you have to understand that here, what's different is that your treatment, you know, does have a downstream legal consequence. And that's something that's sort of different, you know, and the legal consequence is not benign. You know, this is not simply someone who has, you know, whatever, a, a claims to have an injury at work and they've got back pain, you know, this is someone who's going to now be executed. And so it, 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 it of the highest order, you need to understand all that you do and you need to take that into account. And I think that, you know, medicine has just done a poor job of teaching about this. Like I talk to doctors and you know, I get a lot of blank stares and, and frankly, you know, evenly if like, if I, when I uh, round in intensive care, you know, I have medical students and just for kind of my own sick amusement, I quiz them and ask them, you know, what are the four principles of medical ethics? And no one ever gets that question. Okay. <laughs> so they just don't even know. So I think, so wait a minute, like, it's like uh, giving you a driver's license and saying, just go drive around, but don't worry about the rules of the road. You know, like everything is in medicine is ethical. There's no part of it that's not. And if you can't even trot out the four principles, you know, then what are you even doing? So that's a failure of education. You know, that that's a, I don't know, a failure of the profession. I, I, I know I don't look to the profession kindly here. Uh, um, that's just, you know, that's my experience. Yeah. If yeah. I could uh, just add on just a little bit to segue out um, on top of what Joel was saying, it gets all the more complicated, doesn't it? Because you do have these other, other kinds of threads. I mean, first of all, we have doctors who are actively participating in their testimony, knowing that um, their testimony is going to end up uh, winning somebody's execution, such as Dr. Death, who would regularly testify that um, inmates were fairly certain to commit another, you know, to be a future danger. And in Texas and a number of other states, that was a key criterion uh, to, to execute an inmate. You couldn't execute them otherwise. Uh, and you would have somebody testify to that effect. So they're not even bothering to make the person better or you know, improving their health uh, to know they're gonna be executed uh, as a result of that. They're, they're actively involved in leading somebody down uh, the hallway to the, to the death chamber. Um, so, and, and number two, I just want to point out, of course, that doctors can be invaluable and have been in, in saving people from execution. And we've seen that time again, uh, you know, particularly in the narrowing in the United States of categories of individuals who are privy to execution. We no longer uh, execute individuals who are cognitively impaired. The older term is mentally retarded. We no longer execute juveniles. Uh, we no longer can uh, punish... Uh, with for with life without parole uh, juveniles either. Uh, in 2019, the uh, Supreme Court, granted not this Supreme Court, but our older Supreme Court, uh, you know, uh, upheld, um, you know, a case of not executing uh, an inmate who uh, doctors had determined was uh, had uh, was had dementia, was probably Alzheimer's, and couldn't remember. He couldn't remember his crime and therefore didn't couldn't understand why he was being punished without doctors uh those cases would would evaporate um so but number three and this gets to you know yet another kind of component of this that i think you were alluding to uh joel and certainly the legal profession is is not uh is not immune from this but you know there's surveys showing that a substantial number of doctors would be willing to engage in a lethal injection execution. I mean, one saying what, 19% of uh, doctors surveyed said that they would be willing to engage in a lethal injection execution. There was another survey saying 25%. I think if you, if you, if lawyers could do it, they, it would be even higher, but 
uh, you do have an attitude where perhaps these people don't think this is unethical, right? Their, their idea of ethics, so those, those four, four components that you were talking about, my, they might view them differently than the way, than the way you do. So, uh, you know, I just thought I would, you know, add that to the mix here. Well, you know, the American Medical Association does have a statement, you know, where they say that they're, you know, that, that members should not participate uh, in, in execution. Now, they would counter, or those maybe who oppose that would say that the American Medical Association only has like a 20% uh, membership rate of all American physicians, so they can say whatever they want to say. Um, of course, there's going to be some difference of opinion here. Um, I, I, you know, I, I try very hard. And they've never punished anybody for participating in it, right? They've never sure. punished. No medical society in any state, as far as yeah. I know, and you would know far, has any, yeah. ever punished a doctor for participating in an execution. Well, not, not only that, but of course, there was a case, you know, the maybe, you know, you know, in North Carolina, where there was a couple of physicians yeah who were participating in an execution and the state medical board tried to discipline them. And so they tried. brought, they, they tried, they brought an act, you know, a, a complaint against them. And, and they said, wait a minute, if we're just following the law, which we are, then how can you discipline us? Now, you know, medical boards, of course, are convened through a medical practice act. Uh, and, um, but to be, you know, what came out of that case, of course, is that if you really want to know who the chief physician of your state is, it's your governor, okay? So the governor, you know, is the chief physician of the state and can decide what it is that doctors do or don't do. Even though there's lots of things that I need to be able to, hoops I need to jump through in order to practice medicine, if the state decides that, oh, by the way, you know, those things you know, I have a use for them and I'm going to provide you with cover, you know, and even if your organization, uh, you know, like you could, you can lose your license for moral turpitude. You could try to do that, but the problem is, is that if it's lawful, it's hard to discipline against it. And yes, that's kind of disappointing. But you know that the, I think that the, um, the, the that physicians here, like I, I guess I would, I would, what I the point I wanted to make was that when it comes to execution, I, I can you know believe it or not, I can take the position that. I'm not an abolitionist, okay? That I can just say, look, I'm here because medicine doesn't need to be here. And if you wanna kill people, that's you, the state's job. You don't need me, okay? That's my argument, that I'm not trying to stop you from killing people. I'm just trying to stop you from killing them with medicine and with science. You know, you can use another method if you want to, not for me to say what that method is, because I'm not an expert, but you don't need me. So. Doctors who think that they're needed here, that's, I think, a problem, you know, because doctors aren't needed. You don't need me to kill people. Yes, and this gets into the intricate question, doesn't it, of the history of the death penalty, its relationship with the medical profession, because, of course, originally, when the death penalty was imposed in religious communities, the theologians were the doctors. And then we can come to uh, Dr. Guillotine, the creation of the French uh, uh, execution, as Deborah's pointed out to, uh, with uh, Jay Chapman's uh, introduction to lethal injection. Then we come to in England, Al Alfred Pierpont's uh, consulting of uh, British doctors to find the right hangman's knot. And uh, it becomes quite, it becomes an intricate question, doesn't it, with regards to Joel, you've spoken a lot about Beauchamp and Childress's four principles of medical ethics. I think it's just this non-malfeasance, beneficence, and autonomy, isn't it? And so therefore, when we look at those principles, I guess my question is, has there been an, an article or some writing on taking Beauchamp and Childress's four principles and articulating how the death penalty actually is inconsistent with each of those principles? Has, has that been done to your knowledge? Or maybe it's something for your next article. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I should have a quick answer to that. I mean, I guess maybe I feel like those things have been addressed. I mean, right. you know, the, the ethics, like, it, it's been a surprisingly ineffective uh, tool here. I don't know what to yeah. say. Like, yeah. it, you know, it just hasn't it's been, good. it hasn't caught on. Yes. It hasn't made people, and I, yeah. I think that, you know, that we tend to be, you know, we tend to be, uh, console, you know, like uh, 
we're consequentialists a little bit in the way that we approach this. Yeah. You know, yeah. we just yeah. say, look, uh, here's the greater good here. And so that's what I'm working for. And again, the, you know, whatever the problem, of course, is how you define the greater good. But once you decide that this is what it is, then that covers a lot of sins. And, and uh, so that's, I think, the problem. But I would say, you know, and I've said before that ethics is are just, it's not well taught, you know, it's not well understood. And it's not surprising to me that doctors, you know, don't quite get this to, you know, and I say this with, you know, I don't know, all due respect, or maybe <laughs> not, but I, I think it, uh, at least it's an observation, you know, that, that I, I've had. Yeah, so I agree. Yeah, I completely agree, uh, Joel. So ethics is not the way in. Can, can, can we um, just go over to language then? And I know that uh, Robin Conrad is in the audience. And so if Robin ha wants to contribute, please raise your hand and you can have an intervention and please uh, engage with us on this, because, of course, Robin is the real expert here. Um, now, what I found fascinating about the Glossip and Gross litigation, and, uh, and I will just say, when I read the transcript of Robin's uh, cross-examination, especially of the, the state doctors, and then with the use of her experts to, to have a look at the ineffective, ineffectiveness of midazolam to achieve what the state said it would achieve, what was really remarkable was the clarity of the explanation of the interaction and what happens in the brain with the GMA uh, receptors. And, and it was so clear as a lay person reading that medical communication on those issues, that it would be reasonable for a judge to take that, the state really didn't re revert it at all, and, um, and to take that and say, right, okay, we, it, midazolam doesn't do what it is is designed to do by the state and therefore we will um, uh, say that the, that the protocol doesn't work and it was really fantastic but the judges didn't all the way up to Justice Alito and now giving concession to Justice Sotomayor who gave the most wonderful dissent um, she engaged properly with the science but so I guess what my question is in the language of how doctors communicate and with the language of how judges use the science to communicate their results, is there a disconnect between legal language and scientific language? And if so, or is it just purely politics? Is it, I, I'm on the political right, so I'm gonna advise the death penalty, I'm on the political left, but, or is there something we, we can engage in more clearly, do you think? So I'd love to hear Robin's, um comments on on this as well. Robin, if you want, I don't want to put you on the spot, but. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Robin. Okay. Hi, hi. I can't come on video right now because I'm actually having work done on my house. So I'm in my bedroom in the dark. <laughs> but thank you so much um, for giving me PTSD. Um, I, I think part of it is just an intellectual dishonesty that the, the legal field wants these clear answers. You know, they want, they want their standards. They want things to be clear cut, like, okay, we, we can fit into this box. And as we know, science doesn't fit into a neat box and there's not just one answer. I, I think the thing that still bothers me about the case regarding the use of midazolam is that that drug by all of the testing that was done on it all of the you know research in the scientific and medical community is that it's not going to do what the state says that it's going to do right it just doesn't have the the um scientific qualities and i'm by no means a scientific expert or medical expert um i knew probably just a, enough to get me through um, uh, litigating that case. And even then um, was not, um, not nearly as good as it could have been had I had a medical background. But um, I, I do think, you know, some of this, as you mentioned, gets um, tied up with the political, you know, like, again, outcome, we, we need to reach a certain outcome. And so it was very, very clear um, to those of us who litigate death penalty cases that we were getting a clear message from the Supreme Court that they really didn't want to hear anything about these cases anymore as it relates to lethal injection. Um, because I think, I, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but um, Professor York, I think that the, the, the evidence was clear in favor of our clients as opposed to the state. I mean, the state's 
expert literally had no support for his opinion, zero, zilch, none. Um, but the, the judge who was hearing the, um, the case at the trial level sat there and wrote down verbatim what the, what the state's expert was saying and really didn't pay much attention to our multiple experts that we had. So thank you for letting me contribute. And can I comment on that? Yes, yes please. Yes. So, so I, I think that, you know, as an expert, what's, I understand that the court grants me the special privilege of giving opinion. So in courts, normally, if, you know, people are just supposed to report on facts, but as, a, as a, an expert, recognized expert, I can give an opinion. And if the court thinks that, uh, it, that what I say is common knowledge, then it doesn't really need me. You know, then I don't need an expert. So an expert is something that is supposed to there be there for a circumstance that is not common knowledge. And what I've encountered increasingly is this sense in the courts that they understand this, you know, that they don't even need me anymore. Like they've heard it before. They've now taught themselves. They've read something, you know, they Googled it and now they know, you know, and, and that has been um, a distressing a thing that I've encountered increasingly, like in my in my Bucklew case, um, you know, there was this very odd um, opinion at the Supreme Court by Gorsuch, where he's taking apart an article that I cited, and I thought, you know, man, like you don't have this right at all, and and he's writing that he's got it right, and I don't have it right at all, and I think, what are you talking about, you know? So it's that sort of of language that I find as an, and, and I'm not an expert in everything, you know, I'm just an expert in this thing. So I feel that's frustrating. The second thing is midazolam, like, let's be clear about midazolam. And, and maybe I could just for a second talk about midazolam and the problem of even of, of pentobarbital, which are used commonly in execution. So I was given a, a, um, a, uh, a stack of autopsies, 43 autopsies of people who were executed. Uh, and uh, and uh, they were either executed with midazolam or uh, primarily or with pentobarbital. And I was given this because I was asked to look at pentobarbital blood levels. That was really the inquiry. But when I looked at it, I realized what I had in my possession was 43 autopsies that included also um, you know, the, like the, uh, the organ and evaluation of the organs of the body as well. And it was there that I first made this observation that there was this problem of fluid in lungs, okay, of what's called pulmonary edema that had not been described before. And that was clear in about 80% uh, of the time, 70, 80% of the time. Now, um, there was a uh, pulmonary edema is like uh, drowning in your own secretions. And you can't see it very easily at execution, but sometimes you see people cough and struggle. And it occurred to me that what that was, was pulmonary edema. Now, why that happens, you know, it may have something to do not with the drug itself, but with the way the drugs are constituted. And, and so there is, uh, you know, a thing in chemistry called pH, and it's a measure of whether drugs are acids or bases. And it turns out that midazolam is a strong acid. And that, um, and that pentobarbital is a strong base. And when you inject strong acids and strong bases into the body, it, it, it burns it on the way, all the way through. And it may have been something like that, that is happening. Now, you can't really do an ethical trial to determine whether or not that's so. But in, in midazolam, when I think, when the court said, well, we've looked at a bunch of midazolam executions and they all look fine, in every one that they cite, there was pulmonary edema at autopsy. So obviously they couldn't tell by looking. And they, you know, to my earlier comment, the problem with the death penalty is outwardly, it looks so bloodless, but the blood is there. It's just not easy to see through a glass window by a witness. You have to wait till autopsy to find it. So let's be clear. This is not simply falling off asleep and dying. This is being burned up by the on the inside. And, and, and that's really what seems to be happening here. Now that may be fine. That may be, that may comport with what people think is right. But, you know, I thought that once I showed this information that courts would go, oh, thank you. Like, this is terrible. We, we don't mean to be doing this, but instead I've got this kind of reaction like, okay, thanks, but we're, we're good. That's just the normal pain of dying. And, 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 uh, and we don't really need you expert because 
we know what midazolam is and we know what pentobarbital is, or we're going to listen to some other, you know, quote expert that isn't really not expert at all, but really just, you know, it comports with our, our position and that's what we're dealing with. And that's the problem. Great. So I have other questions, but I'd like to open it up to the audience. So, um, Margo, can I ask you to um, uh, be the compare um, to see if we have any audience questions? Yes, I know that we do. Um, I don't know why they've not been posted. Um, I did get one through. Hang on one second. Apologies. Um, I've got one here that says, um, do you believe that there's ever a humane way to execute somebody? I, I don't know what human means. I think humane means human-like, I guess. And so, you know, even when we say hu, hu, I was only human, we're, we say we use it because we've done something terrible. So, uh, you know, I think that, and the court, you know, Debbie can correct me if I'm wrong, but the court actually is not interested in humane. They're interested in not cruel. And, and, and that's really what we're trying to do. And these things are not the same thing. Yeah, I, and... I just wanted to add on to that too. I mean, as Joel said earlier, the Supreme Court, at least the Supreme Court in, in this country recognizes that, um, that the death penalty is associated with some amount of pain, uh, that it's not pain-free. Again, you know, to repeat what Joel said, we, nobody really knows what, what that means, but uh, they're just assuming that death is associated with some pain. Um, I think the firing squad becomes the closest to a painless death. Um, uh, again, Joel, may, you may disagree on that, but uh, at least, you know, according to the testimony that's been offered by, by experts, one, you know, James Williams in particular in Texas, but, but other experts too, Jonathan Groner, the, who I think is more widely known because he's also testified about lethal injection, uh, at least the evidence that we have from the, you know, from the uh, outside suggests that it's the, the most humane. Is it completely painless? Probably not, but it's probably the most humane method of execution that uh, that we have on the books right now. It it, uh, it wouldn't. Um, I would appreciate it if courts uh, actually of states adopted it, but uh, I can understand that others others would disagree on that. Do either of you have any opinion on hypoxia or hypoxia as a method of execution? Yeah. So this is another thing. So there, you know, the the. What's happening and with, you know, with the, um, I think the inevitable departure of lethal injection, you know, states that want to do execution are casting about for another method. And I was hoping that again, I'd be off the hook. Okay, but it turns out <laughs> I am not off the hook because someone came up with this new thing that they call quote nitrogen hypoxia. That's not a medical thing, okay? That uses two words in science together, but I never, that's not something that I do. Uh, and, and I've been asked to try to opine on, on what that would be. You know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, there are, you know, uh, there are what basically the idea of nitrogen hypoxia is that you're going to use now a gas. So this is now like the gas chamber but the gas in this case is nitrogen gas, which is called an inert gas. And, and so, and it shouldn't be caustic to inhale it. It shouldn't be uncomfortable. It's, that's kind of the argument. But now let me just try to put your mind to what that would look like. So now you've got to put a person, I don't know, in a room uh, and maybe- you will be specified, in, right? <laughs> yeah, or you're going to put a bag on their head. I've heard that too, you're going to put a bag on their head and you're going to stick nitrogen gas in there and you're going to wash out the air and do it in that way. Now, I got to think that, you know, in terms of the theatrics of that, that will be great because if they couldn't get Clayton Lockett out of his cell without tasing him, I can't imagine that people are going to want to have bags put on their head and we're going to think that was a great execution. So I just think it's more nonsense. Uh, but there are people, you know, actually there is an expert witness in the US who, who commonly testifies on behalf of the state who's been very involved with nitrogen hypoxia. Uh, this is a pharmacist from Florida. So, you know, it seems to be no, doesn't seem to be difficult to find people who are more than happy to, you know, to aid and abet, you know, uh, with respect to methods of execution that have a scientific sort of ring to them. If, 
I could just add on to that. I mean, this was a method that, you know, as Joel was indicating, nobody has come up with a protocol for it. Uh, we don't know how it's going. No, no state has actually implemented a protocol for it of whether it's going to be in a chamber, whether you're going to have a bag or your head or anything like that. I mean, that's been theorized, but no, no state has actually gone so far as to implement it. Um, and, uh, and the method was originally recommended uh, by, uh, by request by a group of criminologists uh, not medical people, but criminologists uh, in a department who wrote a, I, I've seen it's just like a 15 page report, uh, just coming up with uh, some, you know, old ideas or, you know, newspaper clippings or something, something like that on why they think hypoxia would be, uh, would, why they're recommending it, but all the, also saying at the end of the report that they have no expertise to, to do this. So this is the, the desperation that a state will go to, uh, to recommend a method, uh, which, you know, at least at that point, no medical person would put their name on it. And, and thirdly, it was recommended by, I can't remember the Senator, uh, but it was, uh, who wrote a very brief opinion piece, or maybe you know who it is, Joel, that uh, where it got its, that's where it got its origins. Uh, he wrote an opinion piece in a conservative, magazine it was very short just saying this is this is uh this would be a great way to go and then it gets to the criminologist and then it starts being adopted uh by states as an alternative method of execution without any protocol or any specification uh whatsoever i i did want to lastly just add and maybe you've had this too joel but over the years every once in a while i will get an email from uh from a pilot or an engineer or something, it's been like about a dozen emails that uh, people who have recommended this uh, because it seems like a, in their line of work, it's been, they've known of somebody who's died this way or uh, particularly it, a, a pilot uh, and that they've died a painless death. And why don't, you know, why don't we use that? So, uh, you know, this has been flying around for a little bit, but it, it's still nothing, um, uh, nothing substantial or anything that has that's been any degree of specificity. It's just the same old pattern. I mean, you know, like gases are you know, used in anesthesia. And so uh, it's I can see kind of why someone might have thought about this. And I think, yes, there have been cases where, you know, oxygen deprivation has led to, you know, to death and and uh, when oxygen levels are low, sometimes, you know, people are not, um, you know, they're, they're not uh, realizing it. So like the classic example of this, I guess, would be, or one example would be summiting Everest without oxygen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Everest is a 29,000 feet elevation. And, and there are some people who actually do that, you know, so that's like where a commercial, you know, airline is flying around that altitude. And there's not a lot of oxygen molecules floating around there. So what they say is that if you're summiting Everest and you're two steps away from summiting and something is, and somehow you recognize something is wrong, you're supposed to turn around and go back because you can't problem solve. Like there is this kind of state, you know, of euphoria that might occur where you think everything is fine, except you're dying. And when you actually perform, you know, people who do this, have had CT scan evidence of brain injury, you know, by summiting without oxygen and the effects of it. So they, and they don't even know that it's happening. So I guess I can understand why someone might conceive of this, you know, but I guess someone thought of space lasers too. Like you can always think of something, you know, but is it the job of science again and medicine to help with punishment? You know, to my initial statement, I would add again, no. We, we've had a question from Eliza Harris uh, from, from the audience. She, and Eliza asks, if the courts won't listen to genuine research, and, and then she lists um, all the autopsies, pulmonary edema, uh, other scientific aspects, what do you think they will listen to? <laughs> listen to the scientists, what will they listen to? I'd ask, ask, you know, ask, ask Professor Denno, you know, I'd like to, when you, when you figure it out, would you please let me know and I'll start saying it. <laughs> um, so this is, I'm going to counter what, you know, some of Joel's comments here. Uh, I think they have listened to, 
testimony on lethal injection. To sort of repeat what I said earlier, I mean, there, there was a moment in this country where we had a year uh, of no executions whatsoever because there was so much litigation over lethal injection. And you have people like uh, Robin Conrad and uh, yeah. et cetera, using this kind of evidence extremely effectively. And uh, so I think litigation or lethal injection litigation has been, been uh, has made some of the most powerful strides uh, dismantling uh, the death penalty in this country. Do we still have it? Of course, because it's the United States. We love the death penalty, and we can't seem to seem to part it. And uh, and the state of Texas, what executes a third of all people in this country? So we also have fifty states. That said, uh, lethal injection has contributed to uh, a substantial number of states uh, no longer executing people. It's contributed to a substantial uh, or number of states getting rid of the death penalty altogether. I named you know, New Jersey, which is the state that I had done work in, as a prime example of that. And lethal injection litigation was the, the reason they got rid of the death penalty in that state. Even California, which has the largest death row uh, population in the country, hasn't executed anybody in, since 2000, what, 2006 the Morales case because of lethal injection uh, litigation in that case, uh, and because of all the litigation against their death chamber, their uh, lethal injection chamber, for which they've spent millions of dollars. So uh, so those, those, you know, I look at it from the glass half full uh, yeah. perspective, and I think that's, that's powerful. Uh, it is an irony to me that lethal injection litigation has had far much more sway than uh, other kinds of issues that should be taken more seriously in this country, such as racial inequities, uh, socioeconomic inequities on death row. Uh, you know, the fact that so much of our death row uh, population consists of uh, individuals who are mentally ill, these very powerful, troubling uh, statistics. But lethal injection has, uh, because uh, despite all that we've been saying, this science law uh, conundrum, it's still the most provable, uh, one among the most provable claims because of uh, testifying experts such as Joel. So even though Joel just said that he's, uh, what, you never had a case where somebody has lived, uh, your your testimony is used in so many other cases where life where it has saved lives, and and it's just harder to measure uh, because you're not there to see it. Um, so anyway, that's my soapbox. Well, I, I thank you for that. I mean, look, I think that the way that this is probably going to go away because I think it's going to go away is going to be like t a technical problem. Like I'd like to win it, you know, on the basis of the of the science. Like my the pride of me says, I want to. I just need to configure this argument better, and then you will have this epiphany, and you will say, "Aha! Oh, sorry. You know, I understand now." But the way it's going to go away is it's going to just you're not going to be able to get the components, and, and and or get people to know how to do it. You know, so it turns out to be that's the thing that is seems to be an increasing stumbling block here. And, you know, I, at the end of the day, like, you know, I'm, I'm fine with that too. So um, I, I think that those are important things to discuss. Like, what does it mean to be qualified, you know, to be a qualified person to, you know, to, to perform these actions is not at all straightforward. You know, what the training would involve, you know, what, what certification would look like. You know, if you're certified, of course, it means you can be sued. It should be. It should, you know, then you're an expert and you can fall below a standard. And if you're, you know, falling below a standard causes harm. Like, I'll just, can I just tell a quick story about Frank Atwood that I think I mentioned to Debbie. So Frank Atwood was recently executed in Arizona. Okay. I was involved in Frank's defense. Frank had a problem with chronic pain. He couldn't lie flat. So there's a whole big thing about how he's going to be had to be positioned, you know, on the execution chamber, and so now he's going to get his his uh, intravenous. We're at the intravenous stage, and the people who are doing it are very nervous. Okay, and they wanted they 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 blow their first attempt. Okay, and actually, what I wanted to show you just as my show and tell was just this little needle here. So they have to stick one of these things in him. Okay, you take one of these things out and you stick it in there, 
and you got to kind of get that right in the right spot. Okay. So they don't know they get nervous and they want to go into his groin. They want to stick, uh, put an intravenous in his groin. And, and Frank says, you can get it in my hand. Like, let me show you where my vein is. Okay. So they basically have to get the, you know, the experts uh, starting the intravenous and, and the, the executed inmate has to talk them through where his vein is. Okay. So that's kind of where we are here. So you're trying to kind of figure out who's doing this. What do they know? How do they understand? How are they trained? Just because you can start an intravenous in the hospital, it doesn't mean you can take that information and, and, and transfer it into the execution chamber. It's a very different sort of system. And, you know, that, and that turns out to be a reason why sometimes executions just don't happen or they, or they happen poorly. Thank you. Wow. Uh, that, to continue that, we, we've got four minutes left. We, we've had a flurry of questions coming at the end. If I'm just paraphrasing, I'll throw, throw them out. And, and, and Debbie and uh, Joel, uh, please feel free to answer. Um, the first one is uh, midazolam and sodium uh, pentobarbital. Well, it's sodium fire pentol, or there's the pentobarbital. How do they cause death, Dr. Joel Zevo? Well, you know, it's a very interesting question. I mean, I, I think that, you know, pentobarbital, like barbiturates are kind of a promiscuous molecule, pardon me. So they work on a lot of different body systems, the brain, the heart, and so on. And it's so some kind of combination that causes ultimately kind of a cardiovascular collapse and kind of brain failure, and then you stop breathing. But the problem is that as you die, of course, you've also had all this strong alkali solution that's churning through you. And so you're your lungs get all torn up as part of your death. But, you know, it, so it, it's, it, it causes like kind of total kind of heart brain failure and ultimately your circulation stops and you die. Midazolam is actually not that easy to kill you. You can't kill people with midazolam that easily. And so the way that you die with a midazolam injection is not the midazolam. It's actually that they cut it or they mix it with potassium chloride or potassium acetate and a paralyzing drug. In that case, what they've done is they've kind of just mollified you with the midazolam, and then they give you the potassium, and that, that kind of stops your heart, and the par paralytic makes you that you can't breathe, and that's kind of, you die of asphyxia, you basically, and then your heart, uh, you know, stops with the potassium. We had a question from Marias, who said, who asked, uh, uh, it's a long question, so I'll just paraphrase it, with all the drugs that... Um, uh, it, it, do you think the reason that executions don't look that painful or cruel is because of the drugs used to paralyze and stop inmates from displaying the pain they are suffering? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can I, on, on the back of that, we're two minutes. Uh, Deborah, what, what, and then also to pick it up on your point, Joel, about bloody executions and bringing them behind the walls and the medicalization that stop that bloody process. Is it purely because of the cruel, uh, the Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual, we're looking, focusing on, on this cruelness, is it just to make it um, uh, yeah, less cruel? That's why we've had the medicalization of the death penalty? Or do you think there might be other reasons? I think it, it's to make it less disturbing to the public. I mean, that's why uh, they keep a, a curtain on uh, surrounding the inmate as long as possible, et cetera. It's to, is to reduce people's reactions to the to the execution. Uh, in in when I was interviewing Jay Chapman, he purposely put a paralytic. I mean, that was you know he was the one who came up with these three drugs. He purposely included the paralytic uh, to to for for that very purpose. So you know the problem is of course that the law actually is concerned about the cruelty of the of the person that is killed, but of course you can't ask that person. Okay, so it turns out that the job of the, of the witness is crucial. And so the only way to know whether you're seeing something that's cruel is by engaging your empathy. Okay, so you have to bring your empathy to bear and, and watch and see. And the problem here is by creating this sort of myth, then your empathy is fooled or what you think you're seeing is fooled. And so I would never want to live in a country that executes people uh, in secret. Uh, and, and I think it's important that executions are actually watched even though people might think that's ghoulish, but that's the only way we really even know that anything that untoward is happening because people watch them and, and try to make sense of what they're seeing. And then um, I just, yeah. to, I know we're at uh, time here. No, I just okay. wanted to add on to what Joel was saying too. In Bayes v. Rees, the reason 
uh, for the paralytic, according to the prosecutor's side, was to enable the inmate to have dignity because a thrashing inmate is not dignified. And that was their rationale. It's really troubling. We've got a member of our audience here this evening, Sunny Jacobs, and she's indicated that she would like to, uh, to say something to us. Yeah, um, if that's okay. Um, yes, of course. Yes. I don't know if you can see me. The cat was in the way. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that the participation of the, uh, my husband was executed. Mm -hmm. I was also um, sentenced to death. Uh, both of us, uh, in the end, well, we were able to show that we were not guilty, but it was too late for him. So his was the botched in execution, Jesse Tafaro. It was uh, in the Oh early my gosh, of course. Yeah. So, so Michael Rondelet uh, handled, handled that uh, was there, right, yes. Oh my goodness, I'm right. so sorry. So, okay, so just to finish this off, I think it needs a, a personal touch, you know, and uh, the doctor's participation legitimatizes the whole issue and giving them the, um, the something that subdues them just helps the audience not to have to see the reality of what is being done. Um, I also wanted to say that um, um, that doctors, that it's okay to help kill someone who's dying, but not to kill somebody who's healthy against their will. So they just don't have any out as far as I'm concerned. It's a way of helping the state carry out vengeance. That's what, it's legalized vengeance, but it is vengeance nevertheless. And I think that that could be uh, looked into as an argument. And also, I think it creates more harm. It creates more victims because everyone who's involved with the execution, from the guard who has to take them there, to the executioner, to the, uh, the, the, the governor of the, ex the uh, prison who has to order it and oversee it, to the families, not only of the uh, person who's executed, but of the victim and the people who have to participate in it. Everybody is harmed by an execution. There is no good that comes out of an execution. Nothing that couldn't be achieved in some other way. And then there's the botched execution. You know, it's not always by accident. And we know that yeah. because, of, because the other inmates told us what really happened. And there was a man who is now deceased, he died of COVID, who uh, actually went and examined the electric chair. He was an executioner himself. And he concluded that there was no way that a person could have set up that chair who knows anything about electricity and not know what was going to happen as a result. So there's no good in this. It only does harm to everyone who's involved. And again, the UK is no longer in the EU, fellas. So you know what? I, I bet that it's gonna come up again. There's gonna be some horrible crime and they're gonna, there's gonna be a call for, the, ex, for um, the death penalty to come back there. You'll see, we will see. Um, so I just thought we needed, I know it's time's up, so I'm trying to hurry, but um, I just it's think like, it's okay, Sunny. Yeah. You're a it very does. important voice. I mean, thank you. Goodness. It does, it, it doesn't achieve anything that can't be achieved any uh, another way, and that it's detrimental to the health and well being of everyone involved. That's that's about what I wanted to say. I thought it was important to have the, the personal voice. And thank you all for doing what we're trying to do. And you know what? Even if we don't achieve the end in our lifetime, the most important thing is that we try and we keep trying. Thanks. Thank you. We do have to wrap. Thank you so much, Sunny, for that. Um, <clears throat> and we do have to wrap now because we're out of time. Um, I feel like we might have to do a part two of this because we still have a heap of questions. There's so much more to discuss as well. So um, watch this space. We might be able to persuade <laughs> Dr. Deno and Dr. Zivot to come back. Um, so um, just want to say thank you. I'll hand over to John to just... Yeah, 
Thank you so much, Michael. On that point, yes, yeah, so we had a flurry of questions. If anyone, did, I mean, I, I'm being presumptuous, but if you put your questions to Amicus on death row and then CC in um, Deborah and Joel's uh, Twitter feed, I'm sure they won't mind providing a, a Twitter response uh, to, to, to your questions. If, if, so, so, sorry, Deborah, did you want to say something? No, no, I just, uh, thumbs up, absolutely. All oh, right, yeah. No, yeah, thank, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, thank you so much, uh, Deborah and Joel. That was absolutely wonderful, so informative, so interesting, and also giving us so much food for thought on how to tackle these things uh, in the future. And uh, all the very best to your future work in helping shine the light on how these questions can help reduce the death penalty in, in, in the United States. So thank you so much uh, for, for participating. Thursday. Thank you, John and Margot, very much. Thank Great. you. Thank you all very, so very much. much. Thank I just you. want to say Thank finally, th Thursday, we have our final session, Time on Death Row. What our wonderful uh, participant this evening, Robin Conrad, will, will be participating in that one with Professor William Shabas and also uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Rajiv Kuramito from the, um, uh, from the, my brain's gone, the Commission Against the Death Penalty, the International Commission Against the Death Penalty. So it's a bit more philosophical, looking at some of the ways in which time and temporality and the state controls it and how the defense has to really try to make sure that they understand it to help preserve their lives. So that is on Thursday. So thank you very much to everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And do keep the conversation going on Twitter. Thank you. Goodbye. Good night.